Welcome to Mishkondorea. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'm Stephanie Liston, Senior Counsel to Mishkon, also founder of WIT 20 years ago this year. Um, I was lonely, <laughs> really lonely. I was tired of being the only woman in the room. Can I just thank each of you tonight for coming? I don't feel lonely anymore. <laughs> brilliant, it's brilliant, thank you. Um, we have a number of our directors here tonight, and um, Audrey Mandela, our chairman, who's incredibly organized and um, <laughs> took over the chair 10 years ago and has been brilliant and changed wit forever, Annette Navavi, who I'm gonna hand over to in a minute in, as our mistress of ceremonies on this event, um, Yasmin Majid, and we are sorry we don't have any of our others, but we'd be glad to talk to you more about wit if you'd like to, and with no further ado, Annette. Right. Hello, everybody. The first thing I've got to do is ask who dropped a day travel card. <laughs> um, Bristol Parkway and London zones one to six. Any permitted? If anybody, all oh. oh, right. <laughs> anybody wants it, <laughs> please. We don't want you not to be able to get home tonight. So there we are. So good evening. Um, I'm Annette Nabavi. I'm a board member. Uh, of wit, and it's my pleasure to be chairing this evening's debate on AI and ethics. Um, firstly, a big thank you to Stephanie. Stephanie, where did you? Oh, there you are, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't see you through down. And all her colleagues, uh, thank you very much for hosting us, uh, for helping us with the IT and all that sort of thing. It's such a great venue, and I think you know, so far we've had a really lovely uh, evening. Let's hope that that continues. That's up to us up here. We will do our very best. Uh, now for the, the, the format of the evening. We've got four fantastic speakers and um, what we've done is asked them to shape their presentations uh, into a debate format. So Liberty is going to be talking about how uh, her company is using AI in very positive ways in the medical field, how it's enriching the field of medicine. Amy is going to talk about the way that AI is enriching the human interaction, particularly around mental health. Ivana is then going to tell us what all the other, the other side of the coin, what all the problems are. And then Emily is, Emily, there, is, is going to solve it all for us through law. So that, that's the way that we are <laughs> sorting ourselves out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So with no further ado, I'm just going to ask, uh, well, firstly, I've got to sort this out, but I'm, I'm uh, going to ask Liberty to do hers. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm Liberty Foreman, uh, co-founder of Dynamics Medical. And uh, basically, this company is about creating a point-of-care device that will enable us to be able to diagnose cancer at point-of-care in 15 seconds. So our vision is to be able to use AI to do this. Um, One of the biggest things at the moment is about diagnosing people early, right? So the earlier you can diagnose someone, the better the patient outcome is. The problem with diagnosing people early is that you're going to have to screen a lot of people. And screening a lot of people and a lot of samples means that you're wa not wasting resources, but you're using a lot of resources just to find those diseased ones. And what we're trying to do is to act as a first step to saying, okay, well, it's okay because we've got a really cheap device that you can use, screen in 15 seconds, and it doesn't matter about the volume of samples that's coming through because we're going to make sure that only the ones that are at risk get sent off to pathology. And we do all of this with a technology called infrared spectroscopy. Um, we used to use remotes with infrared, um, and there are lots of different wavelengths of infrared, and it just so happens that pretty much all biochemicals uh, absorb infrared. So that means we can build up this great big library of disease, or progression of disease, so everything from healthy all the way up through to cancer. And that means that I can, we can build this database and start making predictions of new incoming samples and what the likelihood of that sample is to be diseased. So we, we're a software company. Um, I founded it off the back of my PhD. Uh, in 2015. I went full-time in 2016. So basically, this is just showing that the, the later you diagnose a disease, the more chance somebody is going to be to be dying. 
<coughs> and early diagnostic means screening loads of healthy individuals, and we do our best to cut that using this. So this is an infrared spectrometer. We don't make this. I'm a software company. These are commercially available. And when we developed the company, I thought, well, you know, we need to get this out there quickly. And the best way to do that is to do absolutely zero hardware development because it's expensive and it takes ages. Um, so we use commercially available off the, off the, off the shelf stuff. And it works by, you sign an infrared light through a prism and you get a small, very small amount of absorption into the sample, but we can use that to develop uh, big databases with. So essentially we can take any sample. We concentrate on tissue initially, but uh, we could take blood, urine, cells, it doesn't really matter. We use commercially available hardware and we develop algorithms. And these are all based on machine learning and artificial intelligence and combining biochemical knowledge uh, with proven mathematical theories. I'm not developing anything particularly brand new, it's just about we combine all of these in a novel way that no one else seems to have done before. So essentially, what we've been able to do with machine learning is take a sample, which you could imagine being black or white, with just one single scan, black or white might look gray, but we've been able to spectrally unmix that sample and tell that that sample is actually black and white and not just gray. And we've done that by, by putting the spectral libraries, the proven mathematical, the deep understanding of biochemistry, and combining them in such a way that gives us our patent, which hopefully will give us money, eventually. <laughs> so we're focusing on biopsies, um, and this is just because 90 to 99% of all biopsies that get sent off are healthy, and in about five years' time, there's not going to be enough pathologists to analyze them all, but yet there's going to be this ever-increasing demand for it. Um, cells is our second. We probably, as if we carry on on the current trend that we've got, we'll be the world's first company to be able to tell whether somebody has lung cancer from a cheek swab. And that's a, that's a, that's a study that we've been doing at Portsmouth. Uh, we've got about 200 patients recruited so far, um, and we've got about 200 to go. Uh, but so far, it's looking positive. Um, and then aqueous is uh, about biofluids. So we haven't actually started that properly. Uh, we've done a bit of work using urine to detect chronic kidney failure. And when I get really smart, I'm going to rearrange these in some PR genius and say that I can do everything from ABC. <laughs> but I haven't got there yet. <laughs> um, so I started this uh, in, like I said, in my PhD. Um, gone through, got two patents now. Uh, one of them, should I say this? We're looking as though it's going to get granted in the US. So um, <laughs> fingers crossed for that, because that would be a really big thing for us, obviously. Um, we've raised about three million to date. I've got nine employees, and we've ran clinical trials across the UK, four different sites. And a couple of months ago, we landed our first um, promised paying customer in Portsmouth. So that was a, a really big deal for us. So we're about 18 months from market uh, for our first product. and. We start our next phase of clinical studies in about March or April. Uh, that would be the final stage that we need. So I wanted, so that, that's what we do and, and how we use AI. And I wanted to sort of give the, the, the blanket definition of AI because I actually don't necessarily always agree with what the blanket definition is. I ripped this completely off of Wikipedia. Um, but essentially, Artificial intelligence has different meanings in every different context. And I think in healthcare, it just essentially means that we have the ability to solve complex cognitive issues and create a and give a diagnosis based on lots of data, essentially. When I first started doing my PhD, we just called it statistics. Um, it's now got this fancy, it's got this fancy name to it now, which is uh, AI. So I've, I've literally just been doing this as statistics for the whole time. Um, <laughs> but it, it, is, it is incredibly interesting. And I wanted to share a couple of things with you because these have piqued my interest recently in sort of talking more broadly about AI and healthcare. Um, probably all of you have heard of DeepMind. So DeepMind was acquired by Google. They recently uh, published something saying that they've learned over 6,000 plus breast cancer images and they can be better 
than a histopathologist or a radiologist at diagnosing breast cancer. Uh, they're trying to do this in histopathology as well. Um, and what we can say is definitely they're going to be more consistent than a human. So other Google is, I mean, everyone's dream, if you are a CEO of a small startup in healthcare, <laughs> is that someone like Google might buy you one day um, or somebody similar. Um, and that's actually really poignant because Google has pretty much access to every single data set that it acquires yeah. from all of the companies. And it can merge them. And then it can do some amazing things. Like uh, they've looked at, well, not just specifically Google, but a company that Google's acquired, uh, 100,000 drug-to-drug interactions and found out that it's deadly if you mix two drugs together. Now, you wouldn't have been able to do that if you didn't have AI. But what gets really interesting, and obviously this is amazing, is when you start realizing that Google is developing tools where they can search through all of our medical records to get more information from us, which is, you know, which starts scaring us. But we've been doing this, as in Dynamics has been doing this, with um, medical records for four years. And no one really minds, and everyone consents because we've got, we're a small company and we want to do good. But if I was called Google, I don't think everyone would feel the same. Another, another really, really interesting thing that's got my, I don't know how many of you have heard of biohacking. Um, but essentially, biohacking is now, um, AI is so prevalent and people are making tools with it. And gene editing is really cheap and easy to do. Uh, you're now having kind of garage style gene hacking happening. And there was a guy that used the herpes vaccine um, to, he got his friends and his family to consent to this clinical study, which was completely unregulated. And he ended up, he, I think he took about 20 or 50 participants. He ended up uh, curing a couple of people of this particular disease that he was trying to. And this hit the news and it was massive and it was amazing. But what he didn't say was he actually killed someone and a couple of people got really, really sick from it. And it was completely unregulated and he got investigated by the FDA. But we're kind of on the back foot, or the FDA and the regulatory approval bodies are on the back foot. Because these amazing things are happening and they're super cheap and they're getting really far. But we're ending up, <laughs> it's affecting me that because it's stopping me from being able to do my clinical trials, which are good. So it's just something uh, really interesting to think about. So lots of people always ask me, do I think that AI is better than humans? And I'm trying to replace pathologists. Well, sorry if there are any pathologists in the audience. But ultimately, I would like to say that, yes, AI is much better than pathologists because we're going to, we don't need humans anymore. But actually, the truth is, it's probably always going to be a combination of the two. You can't replace one. So we need to start thinking about it slightly differently, less like humans versus computers, and more about a collaboration between the two. Um, and I think this other massive weight that's coming on lots of data companies is that data is now more valuable than gold. But when I was doing my PhD, everyone just used to say gigo which is garbage in, garbage out. And nobody is really assessing the quality of this data. There are loads of companies creating, generating huge amounts of medical data, but no one's really assessing like, how good a quality that is. Um, and so I think that's just something that we need to think about. Um, and the, uh, the last thing is, and this is the thing that really bugs me when I go to a conference, you can't really machine learn in healthcare because if you learn from a patient, you've changed the algorithm. And that means that the next patient that is getting your diagnosis has a better outcome, potentially, or worse, than the patient before them. And therefore, that means that every time you would want to create a new, uh, uh, learn from one patient, you have to do a new regulatory submission. So then you're like six months, six months every time you be patient. So the only the precedent that's been set in the FDA so far is that you can do machine learning, but you have to lock your algorithm, which is technically not AI anymore. 
So um, you can do it, and then in six months' time, you have to pay for an amendment. Um, <coughs> and the current regulations aren't really set up for us to be able, or us, as in other companies like ours, isn't really set up for us to be able to do that. So it's, it's a little bit debatable as to whether we can really say that AI has really reached healthcare yet in a commercial sense, definitely in a, in a research sense, and the benefits are proven. We wouldn't know that there were people would die if they took two drugs together. We wouldn't know that we could be more consistent than a pathologist. And that's sort of my take on AI in healthcare, and I, I'm looking forward to questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So the way I want to, um, to organise this is that we won't take questions until the end because I want you to hear the positives, the negatives and the legal aspects as a whole um, so we can set up the set of arguments and then we'll take questions in all directions. So I hope that's going to work. Amy, over to you. Um, so hi, I'm Amy King from People Matter. Um, I'm a business psychologist so I'm really passionate about what makes us tick as humans. How do we bring together the world of psychology, the world of technology and data to solve real human problems that have genuine impact and change in society? Um, so I've spent 10 years in the world of consulting, um, really applying that to how we start to think about predicting performance, fulfilling human potential, identifying um, how we find ways to reach that sense of uh, best self, how we basically feel fulfilled. Um, and I'm also the co-founder of People Matter. Um, so we're a mental well-being technology startup. Uh, we're two years old. Um, we're not quite as far down the line in terms of our funding yet. Um, but ultimately, um, our stance is that everyone deserves to have positive mental health at work. Um, and what's really interesting is the world that we're in at the moment is pretty crazy. Uh, we have got so much innovation, so much technology at the moment, um, and it's overwhelming. We're always on, our lives are easily disrupted, um, and we've got this kind of uh, mess of distrust, data, questions, what, what does it all mean, and how do we keep up with it? Um, and more and more of us as a result are feeling lonely, which is quite contradictory given we're more connected and, and exhausted. And when you look at the data of the problem that sits out there, um, in general, one in two of us will find that we hit some sort of exhaustion. Uh, one in two of days off are due to stress, anxiety, and depression. Um, and it's costing our uh, economy as well. So um, it's not just taking time off and, and not feeling your best. It's showing up and, and not really feeling engaged with, with what you're doing. So there's lots of stats um, that I could talk about for a very <coughs> long time. Um, so that's kind of the world today and technology. Uh, that's not necessarily about AI. So we're on a mission to change that. We want to create a more caring world. And that's not just about us as individuals, that's about how our environment, our workplaces, are impacting us on a daily basis. So what if we can take all of this innovation, AI, machine learning, technology, whatever you want to call it, and flip it around so that we're designing it to benefit the human? Because um, our view at the moment is we haven't really adjusted to this this world that we're in. It, we're keep playing catch up the whole time. So what if we can use this technology to benefit us and how we feel and being our best selves? Um, so we've been building intelligent wellness tools. Um, our product is called Akina. It helps you to measure and improve your mental well-being at work. But specifically, it starts to look at how your environment and factors around you could be um, impacting you, whether you're likely to thrive or whether you're likely to burn out. And then from that provides really personalised recommendations to help you make really specific changes in your life. And for the organisation, we really focus on how do you start to get a read of culture, not individuals, but what is the environment like? Have you got a hard and fast environment or is it caring and nurturing? Are you helping people to thrive? Now, what underpins that is it's not just subjective well-being. It's not just how am I feeling right now. Um, so the fascinating thing is we are every day throwing off data about our lives and you hear lots of horror stories about that. Um, but that data is actually painting a picture of what's happening in your life, your work patterns, um, your life patterns. Are they in balance? Are you overworking? Um, and so we aggregate um, millions of data points together from your uh, digital communication um, back patterns and provide insights back to you on what that might mean for you. Um, so we use machine learning to build that. 
And then the clever part then is how we then join that up to what's the impact, how do we start to tailor those recommendations to you so you can make positive change. Um, now, I'm a psychologist, so I have to talk about psychology somewhere. Um, um, but underpinned in any AI, it, it, you have to have a basis and a grounding to what you're trying to achieve and what's infor informing it. You can't just have a black box trying to achieve something. So we look at uh, four different areas um, to uh, inform our models. So we look at um, what pressures are you under, have you got positive influences, and have you got the right behaviours? Because these are all in your control, in your environment, to help impact how you feel and then you've got your emotions. Um, and all of that then gets packaged up to basically create a mental wellness companion. So think of it as a Fitbit. It gives you a read and a measure at any one time, and it helps you to be more in control with your own data so that you can be your best. So that's us. Um, but what I'm going to do is kind of move us into the human problems that we face based on this world today and how AI can start to allow us to look at those problems in different ways. Um, so it, it sounds a bit stark, but humans are suffering. Um, AI has the ability to make predictions, and that's really where the models come in. Um, so if we take mental health uh, to the next level, which is on the mental illness side, um, one in four of, us, four of us in the UK will have a mental illness um, episode at some point. 15% uh, of, the, of the global population um, experience mental illness. But the really stark thing is only 50% who do experience difficulty, whether it's depression, anxiety, um, a learning disorder, actually gain access to get the help that they deserve. So there's some really um, fascinating uh, tool sets that are coming out now, um, one of which is Ginger. Um, so Ginger's trying to deal with the fact that there's a block for some people in asking for help. There's stigma, you don't want to talk to someone, and even the idea of talking to a human online is a scary thought. So they've been developing over billions of data points um, an AI chatbot that you can log on to, share, share how you're feeling, share your symptoms, and then it will tailor a recommended plan, plan to you. And if you want to, you can go on to um, speak to someone. Um, building on that further, this is um, really fascinating. Language paints a picture of how we're feeling. Now, this study was run by the World Wellbeing Project, and they looked at, um, I think it was half a million, um, social media posts from people who signed, for this, uh, signed up for this experiment. And they were looking at the construct of language. Are there certain words that get used more than others? And could these, again, paint a picture and provide clues as to whether you're likely to develop a mental health illness? And what they were able to do is to determine three months in advance, based on what words were being used, if you were likely to experience depression. So the point of this is it's trying to get proactive interventions before it gets to the point where it gets um, really bad. I'm going to take this a step further. You're going to have to bear with me. Um, so I guess building on this uh, a step further, there's two more steps here. If you're a parent, it's really hard today because there's a real dichotomy in different worlds. It's moving so quickly that it's hard to keep up with technology. What's the new social media platform? What's going on? And do we need to worry that our children are at risk? Um, so, and particularly if you're a minority group, you're more likely to be targeted and cyberbullying has become a thing. So Bark has become a parental control app, which just gives you that safety measure as a par parent. It can tap into your children's text messages, emails. I know it sounds very big brother. Um, and it can start to look at language patterns to say, is there something unusual here? And is there a red flag that we need to raise? Um, and obviously, we hear the stories when it's gone really bad. But ultimately, um, it's there to, create, to protect people. Um, it will get more brighter in a minute, I promise. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is AI has it can impact all parts of our lives. And if we can get to the point where there's prevention, um, we can start to actually be really proactive to make real societal change. So this is a sad fact that every 40 seconds, one person dies from suicide. So Facebook is developing algorithms. Again, this has been in the news, um, which is looking at language patterns to see, are people showing suicidal intention? Are they expressing um, a language pattern that could suggest they're at risk? Um, and actually, they have um, intervened uh, directly now to, it will probably be more than this now, but 3,500 individuals who are genuinely showing real, really serious signs of suicide. Um, so all of that is 
done without any human analysis, no manual labour. It's through a computer tapping into data that exists out there already to try and create a more positive change. Um, so the other human issue is we, we think we have the answer to problems all the time. We make assumptions about what the issue really is. Um, now, when you look at the gender pay gap, which is different to gender equality, um, gender pay gap is about if you just aggregate um, the average um, wage of a man versus average wage of a woman, what, is there a difference and is it significant? Um, now, at the moment, 78% of figures companies report that there is a gap. The really depressing thing is the World Economic Forum have suggested, based on the speed of change, it would take 217 years, which is crazy um, and not, obviously not acceptable. Um, so there's this amazing company called Gap Square, uh, based in Bristol. It's a tech startup as well. And they're integrating into HR systems, payroll, any data that they've got really on their people um, to start to model and to understand um, what is actually happening. Like, if, is there a gender pay gap issue? But more importantly, why? So they had a story that they shared where they thought their issue was the fact that there weren't enough senior women in, le in leadership positions. When they ran the model, looked at the data, it wasn't that at all. It was that they had a leaky managerial pipeline. So women were dropping out from management positions. And it just meant that you, it wasn't about the senior level. It was, it was the management level that was, that was letting them down. So they're using machine learning to build those models and to um, identify the problem. The other issue with humans um, is that we are very biased. Um, so we've had this age-old problem of can we actually spot when we're interviewing someone uh, whether they're going to be amazing when they hit the when they hit your hit the job, and that all these individuals here, Steve Jobs, Walt Disney, Oprah, J.K. Rowling, to name a few, at some point in their life were told pretty much blank that they were never going to make it, they weren't going to surmount to anything, and they had no talent in some shape or form. And obviously, you look at them now. We have a bias and a judgment system that doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate. There's some really interesting experiments on psychologists. I've, these ones fascinate me, um, where you start to look at experiments that are taking um, the same data. So if you look at CVs, um, this particular experiment had two uh, kind of Western white names and two African-American names, and they're exactly the same. And they ran it to see whether how, who got the same how many callbacks were made in each group. Um, and there were double the amount of callbacks in the Western names than there were the African-American names because we have a bias system that sits in what we do. Building on that further, um, our natural biases also mean that we often um, draw on our context to make decisions. So in this particular example, um, a researcher basically asked um, uh, professors to judge applications. And there was a female application, there was a male application. And they were asked to judge the confidence level, and they were asked to say, what salary would you offer this person? So on the blue side, we've got the male applicants, and on the pink side, we've got the female applicants. Um, so in general, males were um, rated to be higher, and females were rated to be lower. Their applications were exactly the same. The writing was no different. All they knew was there was a gender difference. So we have inbuilt to us these human biases. The opportunity is how do we take these biases and remove them and start to apply a more objective way of measuring and starting to build algorithms that allow us to be more accurate and more fair. So Head Start is um, another AI company. They specialize in recruitment. How do you make it fairer? How do you make it more diverse? Um, and simply by removing CVs and basically plugging in their technology to applications and data on video interviewing and other kind of recruitment sources, they run their algorithm and match you to the job. Uh, they don't ask a human to do that judgment. And they've had amazing results where they've reduced bias by 20% and they've increased their diversity because there's not a human saying, oh, I, can't, I can't pronounce that name, um, so I, don't want, you know, I, I can't see you. Um, so, so all of these are just human problems where a technology can be applied in a novel way. Now, it is controversial because there is this sense of, um, is AI dangerous? And obviously, is there bias within the AI when you think about scaling that up? But there's also an argument that if you go about it the right way, 
then AI or technology can start to spot bias in its own right, which we don't really talk about enough. Um, and that's really what, so Frida Polly is a, um, the CEO and founder of a company called Pymetrics, another recruitment company. Um, and she's, her argument is AI is a mirror of us in how we build it. It's a mirror of how we think, it's a mirror of how we behave, and the data is representing that. So you have to be really conscious and really aware of how you build AI. Um, but it's not, AI is just a tool set, it's a capability that we've, we've developed ourselves. Uh, but we have to be conscious of how we do that. So my lasting thought of my many, many slides is, what if we started to apply technology and AI to remove these biases and these human tendencies that can actually create difference, that can create um, inequality, that can hold us back as a society and create more space for the connection, for the empathy, for the care, so that we can actually start to align as, as a society. And this was a final quote that was actually posted today, which I thought was very relevant to that, which is um, by another psychologist. So he said, paradoxal, paradoxically, the AI age may end up emphasizing the human side of leadership, since leaders cannot outperform machines when it comes to managing data, information, and well-defined problems. They will predominantly compete in their ability to manage people, including themselves. So that's my final thought. Um, I know I've, whistled, I've gone through a lot, but what I wanted to do was paint kind of a full kind of sphere, and this, that's just scratching the surface, in all honesty, of it, how we relate to AI and how we think about its application is really important, and there's ways in which it can do good. Um, and that's, that's really everything from me, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amy. So we now know all that's really good on the medical side, all that's really good on the uh, human interaction side. And we can see there's a lot of really interesting things that, that AI is allowing us to do. But there are issues, and that's where I would like Ivana um, to tell us more from her perspective as somebody who's looking at the, the whole issues of, of trust, of, of your personal data, and, and the way that's used. So, Ivana, if I could ask you to take to the Thank floor, that would be fantastic. Can you hear me? Great, fabulous. Uh, so, I mean, these two presentations were amazing. I mean, I'm really full of, of energy and, and positive about what this women are doing to better our world, and, and, and it's fantastic. So thank you so much for, for, for this. Um, I, in my day job, I'm a technical director at Deloitte, which I joined two weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, I have the privilege, a little bit in my, this job and the, the previous one as well, but I have the privilege to be working with large companies across the world that want to innovate using AI. And they want to innovate doing the right things. So they say reputation and trust is the most important thing that we've got because the reputation and the consumer's trust and the customer's trust is that competitive edge so that we can compete and grow in, in the world that we live in. And you know that because of what you do. So these companies, they say, we want to use artificial intelligence. We want to um, start using artificial intelligence in recruitment. We want to start artificial intelligence so that we can support our employees. We want to use artificial intelligence so we can sell better. We can target our advertising. We want to use artificial intelligence so that we can improve our cancer uh, diagnosis and, and, and really help people live better and live longer. And that's great. The companies want to do this because the potential of technology is absolutely amazing. It's great. And there's so much that companies can do with artificial intelligence. Although, as you were saying correctly, AI, I'm not even sure it's the right terminology to describe what we're doing right now, but artificial intelligence is, is a broad term and something that has existed for a very long time. But because of the huge amount of data that we've got, now, of course, we can take all this to a completely new level. So all this is fabulous. And I love these organizations that really say, we want to do it right. Yeah? And then we say, how do we do it right? How do we create the right governance structures, the compliance with the regulatory framework? But we do things in a way that people can really trust us and they feel 
that we harness data, but at the same time, we safeguard and we respect people autonomy. Do you know why this is happening? Because over the last few years, we've seen the best of technology, but we've also seen the worst of it. We've seen the actual worst of technology. I'll give you one name, Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> so I am a techno passionate. I love tech. I love it so much that I want it to work for people. So in order for technology to work for people, I say to my clients, I say, we've got to do it right. The fact that something is technologically possible doesn't mean that you have to do it. The fact that a product is off the shelf and it's nice and it's glamorous, it's great, it doesn't mean that you have to deploy it. Is it actually going to solve a problem that we have? Facial recognition. Everybody's talking about facial recognition right now. Major issue of our time. I'll come out clean. I am for a moratorium. The reason why I'm for a moratorium is because being watched, but also the idea of being watched all the time changes the way that we inhabit our public spaces. Changes the decisions that we make about, am I gonna hug this person or not? For example, if my parents don't know if I'm gay or not. Am I going to actually be free in a space? Is it actually creating or breaking the trust that holds us together as a society. And the problem with facial recognition is that because it's available, doesn't mean that we've got to use it. Now, facial recognition is many things. I love the iPhone XR that you can log in with your face. That's facial recognition. I do like that. But it's very different than walking in my local shopping center, Westfield and knowing that I'm being watched and I've been matched against millions of other people in a database. And people say, oh, well, be careful about facial recognition because it's biased. Well, actually, that's not the problem. I don't worry about where AI goes wrong. I worry where AI goes right, especially when it's about facial recognition. This is something that we need to talk about. Facial recognition is a very complicated thing. And before we start being watched all the time, we need to decide, is it solving a problem? Do we need it? And what are the trade-offs? And I'm talking about trade-offs because trade-off is all what artificial intelligence is all about. Take medicine. If I am a patient, I want to be treated well. If you say to me, do you want to give me your data? And I'll do this and this. I'll say, take everything you want. Because I want you to detect if I get breast cancer way before that it gets really, really serious. Why? Because privacy is contextual. It depends on the context. And the same is when we ex explainability of artificial intelligence. If my doctor says to me, you are developing cancer right now. I don't care about how the algorithm works. I just want to know that it's accurate. And that's her job, not mine. But if, he, if, if, if I am a doctor, I do want to know how that algorithm works. Because I am the one going to tell a patient that the patient is going to get cancer or has cancer. So I need to know because I'm the practitioner. So even explainability, it's contextual. It depends on who you are. If I go on an airplane, and if you fly, you don't go into the airplane or British Airways, open the engine, look inside, and check how the airplane works. You trust it. You trust it. Why do you trust it? Because you know that the airplane wouldn't be able to fly without due diligence and controls. This is what we need due diligence and control. I don't know about how airplanes work. I don't know. I never see. I mean, I don't know how the engine works, but I trust it because I know that there is some sort of regulatory body that has been there, has checked it. I know there is a framework that 
all the players need to follow in order to be compliant with the law. So I can know, I know that I'm safe to go on that plane. Trust is the most important thing. So I always say to organization, we're in a very complex area, always. And what you need to do is you need to determine your own trade-offs in an area where regulatory demands change and evolve at all times. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what explainability of an algorithm will really be. We don't know what a human in the loop would really mean. A lot of it would be a court probably telling us what that means. But that trust is absolutely essential. Because without that trust, we can't really get the most out of technology. And at the moment where we are, I feel, and I don't know if you agree, that there has been a lot of loss of trust in technology, a lot of it. Because of the scandals that we've seen, because of the fact that people say, well, hold on a second, AI looks great. But actually, it's biased. And I'll go back to the bias thing. Because I take a different view on this. And by the way, I've got a book coming out on this. Sorry, <laughs> I've got to say it. <laughs> Ready to pre-order online, Waterstones. It's called Artificial Revolution, Power and Politics of AI. You can buy it. Pre-order it, $7.99 is cheap. <laughs> Apart from that, and the loan to the book is the 20th of May. So sign up to my mailing list and you'll be invited. But anyway, apart from that. Uh, why am I saying this? Bias. I want us to be, at least to be honest about this. People say to me, why do you care about bias? You know what? I mean, humans are biased. So, so what? As you were correctly saying, you know, we use historic data. If you use historic data, that's what happened. So if an organization want to change the output, it wants to create an equal outcome, they have to make a social and political choice that they want to change historic data in a way that the output is equal. Do you trust this to happen? I mean, we're still having women groups <laughs> because no male boss has ever made that decision. And do you trust somebody to say, oh, now we've got AI. We're going to create an equal society. No. That is where my fear comes from. AIs, if without controls, is going to replicate the stereotypes that we've got in society right now. Amplify them. Turn a stereotype into prejudice. And this is where we should be worrying. It's called automation of poverty and automation of inequality. People in the US in particular who cannot access credit because of their postcode. And a postcode is not just an address. A postcode means how much money you've got and what color your skin is, especially in the US. Bias is a very serious problem, but no algorithmic fix will ever fix the problem of bias in algorithms. It's not gonna happen. So people will say, we can fix the algorithm. It's not gonna happen. Yes, probably, you can do some, something, but unless there is the strong will to change things and to say, actually, we want to do something that we've never done so far, equality, unless we want to do that, we're never going to change the way things are. So just to wrap up, what am I going to say? I want to close on something which is ethics. There is a lot of stuff about ethics, and I work on privacy and ethics by design, day in, day out. Ethics, there are 86 ethics principles in the world. 86. Now, I am asking you to turn these principles into reality. There is the law. AI is covered a lot by GDPR, by a lot of regulatory requirements, although a lot of stuff is not covered. But there is something that goes beyond the law, and this is ethics. And ethics means the fact that something is technologically possible, do we do it or not? What is the impact? What are the intended and unintended consequences of any technological artifact that we create? 
You can create an ethics board, not like the Google one, which was rubbish, but another one. You can create, sorry if there's anybody from Google here. Um, you can create an ethics board, you can create governance. I use algorithmic impact assessment, risk modeling, whatever you like. But you've got to turn these ethics principles into practice. Otherwise, I don't think it's going to be an easy ride. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that I think we're going to embed even more inequality, even more disparity into the artifacts that we are creating. Technology is never neutral, never. And I know I'm saying something that a lot of people disagree with, but it's never, never neutral. When people say, oh, data is neutral, <laughs> it depends on what you do with it. Tech is neutral, it depends on what you would do. No. Technologically, technology represents the values of the people who created it. So it's great that we've got two female leaders in this field, because obviously diversity is important. They create good stuff. But we've really got to be careful and really say, okay, how do we create, how we turn this ethics principle into practice? What does ethics mean in practice for us as an organization? How are we going to be transparent with our customers about it? How are we going actually to involve them in what we are creating? If we are using their data, if we are using their life, themselves, how are we going to involve them and do it with them, this journey? So AI can be fantastic, can be great. Lots of fantastic opportunities ahead of us. But if you really love it, as I do, you really have to strive to do the right things. And it's really important, especially as women, we take this extremely serious. And we've created a network called Women Leading in Artificial Intelligence for that reason. It's not just about getting more women into coding. That's one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is getting more women at the top of businesses to decide when and where are we going to use AI for. That's absolutely crucial. So good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Ivana, for that uh, whirlwind um, review of what the problems are. I'd now like to turn to Emily to give us a little bit of a feel as to how um, the, uh, the law can help us steer through at least some of these issues. And in the meanwhile, I'll sort of see what I can do about this business. So I just want to build on some of the themes that have already come out of the fantastic talks that we've had so far. And in particular, um, Ivana's last talk just now, there are some clear concerns um, about AI technology. Um, for example, facial recognition technology that um, had lots of adverse uh, publicity when it was used historically at the King's Cross development. Um, and that was, in fact, uh, investigated, well, allegedly investigated by both Sadiq Khan and the Information Commissioner's Office, the UK's data protection regulator. The EU itself is actually considering banning all uses of facial, facial recognition technology in public areas for the next five years until regulators have become comfortable about how this technology should be used and how to prevent its misuse. At the moment, we've got some AI software that can detect a whole range of human emotions. And the two case studies being put forward for this technology is firstly in crime prevention and law enforcement, but secondly, to, um, to assess the authenticity of candidates during the interview stage of um, a job process. Um, then, on the other hand, we've got China, who's one of the most prolific users of facial recognition technology. Uh, so at one end of the spectrum, they allow their citizens to buy everything from KFC to drugs using uh, their faces. Um, but at the other end, they're using facial recognition technology to effectively identify ethnic minorities, but also to publicly shame their citizens when they've done something that they shouldn't, even as mundane as going outside in their pyjamas in public. Um, we've got AI that's being used in the employment context, as sort of as Amy mentioned, uh, not only to liaise with employees for wellness, but also to help them report on workplace incidents and f facilitate whistleblowing um, from employees. 
And finally, as we've mentioned, um, the racial and gender bias. Unfortunately, Amazon fell foul of this with its facial recognition technology when its technology incorrectly identified 27 NFL players as criminals and failed to recognise that Oprah Winfrey, one of the most iconic women in the world, was female. So, so what's clear is that there is a lot of um, issues around the technology. There's a lot of concern about the intrusive and passive nature, just frankly, the creepiness um, of how it's used, but also for that um, um, the, the sort of the bias that exists in the uh, underlying technology. So what are regulators trying to do? Now, I would like to look at sort of three um, regulatory regimes. And after that, I'm going to sort of wrap up by talking about the three clear themes that I think are coming out of the regulatory regimes that exist at the moment. So um, these are the three that I would like to talk about. Um, so firstly, we've got the General Data Protection Regulation, which I think is everyone's favourite piece of uh, law to come out for a while. Um, and that governs the use of personal data. And then we've also got the European Commission's ethical guidelines for having trustworthy and ethical AI. And finally, there are the OECD principles on AI technology. Now, these are just three examples. There are some others out there. Um, and for those that are interested, the EU Commission released a report last year. And I have to say it was an incredibly detailed and very thorough report on assigning liability for AI technologies. Um, but I'm just going to focus on these three. So looking first at the GDPR, um, as we've mentioned, AI uses a lot of personal data, uh, which in turn engages obligations under the GDPR. Um, now, the three that sort of the, the three that I just like to highlight are Article 12, um, which obliges companies for sort of data controllers um, to give information to data subjects in a concise, transparent, intelligible, and easily accessible form using clear and plain language basically explain to people how you're using their data. Um, and then articles uh, 13 and 14, which have prescribed uh, pieces of information that you should give to individuals, but crucially, you should tell them if they are the subject of a solely automated decision-making process, and that is effectively AI. Um, so one of the themes of the GDPR, um, which sort of comes out from the articles that I've just mentioned, is that of transparency. Um, and it's about companies being honest and clear about how they use people's data. Now, the ICO has taken one step further, um, has taken this one step further, and in conjunction with the Alan Turing Institute, has published uh, guidance on how users of AI systems should explain how the systems work um, to individuals affected. And so that's going again to that transparency theme. Now, moving on to the European Commission's ethical guidelines. These uh, were born out of a working group set up by the European Commission. Um, and the working group came up with a set of seven uh, non-exhaustive recommendations for how you achieve trustworthy AI. Uh, now, these guidelines are voluntary, um, so they're not binding. Um, and the ones that I would like to specifically highlight are, firstly, the AI system should have human agency and oversight. Um, and that includes telling people that they're subject to an AI system but it also means giving them a way of overriding and challenging a decision made by an AI uh, system. Secondly, the system has to be technically robust and it has to be safe, which means it's got to be resilient to any cyber attacks. It's got to be accurate. And most importantly, it's got to replicate its decision under similar circumstances. The third requirement is that of transparency. Um, and again, that builds on the GDPR's sort of transparency theme. Um, and that goes to explaining to people how an AI decision is made. The system has to be diverse. It can't discriminate and it has to be fair. And that means avoiding the unfair bias that we previously discussed. And finally, there has to be accountability. The system has to be able to be opened up. Um, you have to be able to audit it. And you have to be able to understand where um, a decision was incorrectly made. And you have to be able to rectify that decision. So what's clear from the guidelines is that not only are they building on the transparency theme um, put forward by the GDPR, but they're now starting to oblige users of AI technologies to, be, to have um, fair and unbiased systems, but that there also has to be a human ultimately accountable. And just finally, I'd like to briefly touch on the OECD principles for AI. Um, so these, are, these have all been signed up to by OECD members and additional countries, um, including Argentina, Romania, and Peru. 
and they were signed up to in May last year, and they represent the first time that countries have come together and agreed common principles for AI technology. And these principles include that AI should benefit people, the planet, um, and the planet by driving growth, sustainable development, and well-being. That AI should be designed in a way that respects the rule of law, human rights, democratic values, and diversity, and that should and that there should be appropriate safeguards um, to ensure a fair and, and just system. And that finally, organizations deploying, developing, or operating AI should ultimately be held accountable for its proper functioning. So just drawing these three sort of regimes together, what's hopefully clear is that I think this is the way that regulators are going. These are the three clear themes that you need to achieve ethical and trustworthy AI. That the system has to be fair, it can't be biased. It, you have to be able, be able to explain its decision-making process. And there ultimately has to be a human accountable for the AI system. Now, unfortunately, um, as we know, it's not just as easy as that, and there are so many challenges with trying to put this into practice. Um, I suppose a big one is how on earth do you achieve transparency and accountability when it's such a complex technology where people just don't even understand how it works, let alone to be able to predict what it's going to do, let alone to be able to explain why it's come to that decision. Um, legal systems and regulatory systems are unfortunately very slow um, at understanding um, emerging technologies and so regulating against them. I mean, you only have to look at um, the investigation into Facebook and the questions that were being put forward to Mark Zuckerberg to understand that unfortunately law lawmakers aren't quite au fait with uh, technology as they like to think so. Um, <coughs> But we also need to have um, harmonised uh, regulation across the world to avoid uh, regulatory arbitrage. And we're already seeing divergence between countries. So, for example, China and India, who are ploughing loads of money into AI development, have not unfortunately signed up to any of the principles that I've discussed. And, and finally, that unfortunately, only the GDPR is legally binding. The rest is simply advisory and they just speak to best practice. And so unfortunately, there is no real incentive for anyone to sign up and agree to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, that was a um, set of really interesting uh, views on the way that AI is uh, being used and the issues that surround its use. What I'd like to do is to invite um, a few questions from the floor. I'm sure there will be some. Thank you. I'll start with Bridget. Bridget, hello. Just want to build on the, the, the global uh, AI issues, actually, and pick up on what um, both Ivana and... Um, and Emily have said about China in particular. Yeah. And I've recently come back from being where the Uyghurs are and seeing what facial recognition is doing and linking that to, glow, to a, um, a cultural currency. And it feels like the horse has already bolted and it is scary. And I just wonder what either of your views are on whether or not it is too late to do anything about what China's doing with this or... Is there any hope? Because it is so scary. Who'd like to start on that one? <laughs> um, <laughs> you have a go first, then we'll get Ivana to um, add. I mean, I think there's always uh, there's always the ability, I think, to to rein it back. I mean, unfortunately, what tends to happen, um, and probably speaking on behalf of all all lawmakers everywhere, is that you tend to have a reaction once something bad has happened, and then they try to put in boundaries. Um, I know I, it's terrifying what they're doing in China. Um, because it's just people going about their normal business and then all of a sudden they're suddenly being treated completely differently. Um, I think part of the problem is that there is this, there is no international consensus um, and actually it might, what might happen is that it might encourage bad behaviour where the US might turn around and say, well, actually, well, why are we now agreeing to some of these principles when look what's going on over there and actually they're making so much money from it. Let's, let's row back as well and, and forget about it. Um, I mean, that's an answer I don't know, but I, I'd like to be hopeful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a great question because I, it's a argument book. Okay. Uh, no, the, the artific I always say, I say artificial intelligence is much more than tech. It's about power. 
Yeah, so that's where the power dynamics are coming to the fore, which is sort of this global dimension. What I'm worried about is that everybody's saying we are in a race, in a global race. That is the scary bit. What does that mean, we're in a race? I mean, do we have to, in a race for what? You know, to, to the social credit system, scoring system, where, you know, you have to be, you're watched all the time to see the good behaviour. And then if you've got a good behaviour, then you're rewarded points, which means you've got easier access to housing, you, you can travel more easily, you can buy a, a ticket, you know, that is the kind of system. So that is the scary, the scary bit. Um, there also, the other thing is that if you look at the standards and the global development of standards, that's where we need to, um, to, to watch. And I'm telling you all, if you've got any spare time, do get involved into the development of standards because that's where the global battles are happening. Yeah? So get in touch with me if you want to get involved in the standards because if you just go online and you Google the different um, composition. In, in the standards, in the people who are creating the standards, they speak for themselves. You see the number of people coming from certain countries, try to obviously, you know, in a very sort of democratic way, in a way, you're trying to influence those, those standards that will have a global impact. So if you've got any capacity, do get involved into these standards because this is where sort of the, the determination of, of AI will be happening. But you're right, it's... Uh, I, I don't know if this... So I don't know if you know about uh, the company. I can't remember the name of the company that owns TikTok. No. Um, but they recently exactly. tried to buy exactly. Grindr yeah. or bought Grindr. And now America's yeah. trying to force them to sell Grindr because yeah. Grindr can be used to track US army forces across the world. So it's like become this uh, issue where now it's, it's a, a safety issue. Um, so now they're being forced to sell it. And it's the first time that something like that has happened. Yeah. So the only way that I think you're going to be able to control China is by controlling what it can actually do outside of China. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. Carolyn? Thanks, Annette. Carolyn Kimber, I, I think if we take it back a step, perhaps this is also a generational issue because people of my and similar generations probably don't accept AI easily. We are basically very suspicious about it. And it's not harming our mental health because we've grown up with technology through the years and we've adapted to change. We've accepted what we want to accept and we reject what we know is bad. Whereas generations coming forward at the end of the last century were born into it, and they accept it. They walk around with their phones all the time. They get bullied. Well, nobody's bullying me. You know? <laughs> and we'll be tired if they do. Um, but I, I, I think very much... It's about educating a generation to be a little bit more wary, a little bit more careful, and maybe to switch off now and then to, to look after themselves. I have a different view. <laughs> because, so, I mean, it, it, it's, it's been one. So I get, so I've got a 15-year-old son, right? So he buys stuff. Sometimes he, he, like, he loves books. And he goes on Amazon and we buy books. So he... What? Not yet. No, 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 you, he, he will, he will, don't worry. Like you all. So he goes, so he buys Harry Potter. I'm talking about a few years ago, Harry Potter. Then he gets a recommendation for Harry Potter number two. Then he gets a recommendation for Harry Potter number three. And I'm at, at the end of the month, he's only read Harry Potter. So this generation has grown up with human agency being diminished to point and victims of the architecture of persuasion that is the global internet right now. That's one issue. But to be honest, to your point about the younger generation, I've never seen anybody so switched on about technology for good than the young generation right now. They are so, they want to know, for example, that they want to create products. They like coding, but they want to know that what they create goes for the common good and not for something that is detrimental. And this is a massive shift, I think, in perception. Would yeah. you agree? No, yeah, I would. I think oh, there's so many forces at the moment in terms of this whole space and generations. Yeah. I think 
Young people ca are coming into this global crisis. Yeah. You know, generation before have, have set them up in a way that, you know, that there's a bit of anger, but there's also this social justice of how do we how do we move the world forward? And then you're hyper connected and also trying to make your own way through yeah. life. And so technology and AI are just tool sets and capabilities that you can start to to use, whether it's for personal gain or for social good and, and for the, for what you're trying to do. So they have a different education around it. And I, do, I don't think it's everyone. I think there's, um, I think uh, the younger generation are so used to being switched on that they're, they're thinking more about what's the value exchange as well. What sits behind something? And if I give my data or if I sign up for this, do I trust it enough and do I get enough value back? The risk is when that's not there. Um, and I think that's where the, the fear comes in, which is, do we really know the intent of this business? Do we really know what sits behind this? Can we trust that it works and does the right thing? Um, but I also agree, I think we are consumed by technology. Um, and you know, whilst you know, we can talk about all the benefits, it, it's part of the problem as well, which is yeah. we're addicted to it. And it, it, it starts to actually um, break down barriers, and, sorry, not boundaries, basically. So yeah, I think it's an interesting topic. Thank you all so much. It's incredible to see so many highly intelligent women like breaking barriers and pushing forward in the space. One of the things I want to touch on was that Ivana mentioned that um, we need to be aware and we need to be actively engaged on you know, what decisions we're making when it comes to AI. But I think the challenge is that for a lot of people, we're no longer making those choices and while we might be educated, we might say this is not a good thing, we're not the ones on the European panel making these decisions about fairness, transparency, and accountability. So what I want to ask is how do we have more oversight and input? I mean, we can control a bit more of our own um, data, but, you know, you mentioned this, um, uh, Ivana mentioned about, um, you know, choosing and deciding, but somebody's choosing for us. So what do we do to have more input? I, I don't think there's a perfect answer to any of this. I think the, it, it's the power of choice, isn't it? Which is, there's the everyday choices, which is who am I, like, even in any product that you buy, what does that contribute towards and do you believe in it and do you trust it? I think a lot of people now are actually, um, they're struggling with that. It, 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 there's, there's a disconnect and you kind of go two ways with it, you either disengage and fight against it or you decide to do something about it and lean into it. Some people start companies because there's a mission they want to change. Gap Square that I talked about earlier, I forgot to mention, they want to close the gender gap by 2030 as an, as an, an I as a mission. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Um, but, 217 years. Yeah, I, yeah. I know, it's depressing. Um, but I, th I think it is a good question. I, I guess it's, it's also just, an, it, it's it been accentuated because it's AI and technology and it's the speed of it. But in some ways, it's always been there in some shape or form. I think it's just happening so fast now, or it's really hard to unpack and understand to know even what choices you need to think about. Um, so there's almost the ethics, the standards, the regulation, the law, and, and how that how you kind of stand up for something that you believe in, or there's the everyday choices and kind of what you're kind of putting yourself to. But I think it's hard. I, I mean, that would be my first thought, basically. One of the things that strikes me is that there's an underlying issue here around data, um, that most of what we've been talking about here, we're using data sets of one sort or another. There's been quite a lot of discussion about how you as a person can own your own data and how you might then be able to trade that data. And I'd like to just as a final question to ask the panel to talk a little bit about the trade-off and the way that you as a person can, really leading on from the control question, can control your own data. And is there actually an ethical issue around trading your data for something? So if we could start with the medical, because I think yeah. there's an awful lot of, of that that well, could we, come into this. Do you know, we've been regulated for ages. You have. Like, I mean, we, it, it's not new in the medical field. We have to follow these rules. And actually, the GDPR thing is really annoying because in the medical it's, field, yeah, it, sure. it, they, HRA have recent. There's, these are the governing board that bring stop you from doing bad things with people's data. The average reading age uh, of the UK is seven. Okay, so that's adult reading age. So when you make patient information data, uh, data sheets, you have to it has to be legible by a seven year old. 
And when you try to do uh, talk about GDPR, I mean, that's really hard. So they've brought in these new templates that you have to use, uh, which is supposed to increase transparency. But actually, what it ends up doing is just confusing the patient that's consenting to take part in the study. So where I used to have to say, OK, to be identified to take part in my study, you have to give your name, your NHS number, your address. But that's only ever going to be seen by the medical staff. It will never be passed to Dynamics Medical, and Dynamics Medical will never see anything about you. And if you want to withdraw, you can, and that's totally fine. And if you want to withdraw and not participate in any more visits to the study, that's fine. And if you want to withdraw completely and remove your data, that's fine. Contact this uh, thing and we'll give you all of your data and we'll withdraw you. But now what the HRA makes us say is that we, as a collective, so Dynamics Medical plus the hospital, will take your name, your NHS number, and your address, and we're going to use this and in our fancy algorithms, which is not true. And now I'm being made to simplify things so much that it's just misleading. And we've had, we've had, to, we've had, to, we've had to do that for the last five years, so it's not... For us, it's not a new thing. going in the wrong direction. So that's, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, OK. What about the, the human interaction side, where we were talking about, again, lots of data. Mm. How, how do I, as a person, own that data? How can I trade it in some way? Yeah, so it does come back to choice and awareness and seeking the information so that you can make a decision. So um, in my own life, I will only use apps that I... Ha have a strong privacy policy and T's and C's that clearly state how they use data. So I won't use my fitness pal, and it's very popular, very useful, but they will pass on the data to third parties in some shape or form. And that might be the right value exchange. You think it's a good app and it's really useful and I can't be bothered to look around, that's fine. It's unlikely any major harm will happen to you. But part of, I just, I would prefer to choose an app or a company that has a stance on it and is much more transparent and has an ethical viewpoint. So, but that's, I'm obviously fairly in this space, so um, I think about it and I think more people are. So when I speak to developers, they will literally read the T's and C's to see what is the privacy policy because they know, um, you know, there's actually a real question around what is data security. My developer tells me all the time there's no such thing as data security because there's always a human involved somewhere. But you're putting in as many gates and measures as possible to try and make it as secure and as difficult. Um, so um, so I, I think there's, there's definitely a piece which is by law you have to have um, a privacy policy, you have to state your intention with data. Um, or at least you can tell me if there's uh, any more to that. But um, so, so the information should be available. And if it's not available and you can't find it, then you should be questioning it. Um, of course, you know, the challenge with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook was that was behind anyone's consent. Uh, there was, that was without you knowing. And I think that's probably the question, and, and this is what surrounds all of this, is um, the unintended consequences, or you can't predict everything that's going to happen. Um, and I think we're getting these bodies of mo these movements now, which is, you know, that we've been discussing, which is we have to think about it. We can't just be passively letting a technology and I happen. We have to actually start to define the standards and be proactive because whether it's a global government thing or whether it's our personal lives, um, it, it can play out in so many different ways. Um, so, so, yeah, that value exchange is just, that's your own education and, in, and pursuit to search for do you feel that you've got a good enough understanding of how your data is being used and whether it's worth it. So good. Thank you so much. That's really, really helpful. Um, that gives, I think, everybody a chance to participate in a personal way, which I think is really, really important in this. So I would, given it's quarter past eight and we said we'd finish it about this time, um, I'd like to draw it to a close and ask you to thank the speakers in the normal way.